to um, um, sorry, Zach, I forgot to give you the cue. <laughs> anyway, remind you that um, you know we have people that might be joining later, and they can all have access to the taped uh, presentation. So if, if your presentation is like some of my classes, I know that everyone's going to take it back and play it at 1.5x afterwards. So you can sound like a like a munchkin, uh, you know, delivering this uh, this talk about fintech fintech landscape and deep dive. Um, I'm very proud to introduce to everyone my my son, uh, who is now uh, his name is Zev Shimko. He's the president and chief operating officer of Custodia Bank, which is one of the first banks to seek uh, permission to uh, custody uh, Bitcoin. It's also specializing in other digital assets. So really on the, the cutting edge of this, uh, this new uh, financial technology and the right person to talk to us about FinTech. Uh, we have um, his background includes uh, stints at Morgan Stanley, Upstart and Prosper, which are um, uh, these lending, uh, lending groups, uh, Salt Lending, which is was probably more Bitcoin than lending, and uh, figure technologies as well. And this should all be uh, names you're familiar with. Um, Zeb will speak today about not only his own job experiences, uh, but also taking a, a deep dive into the FinTech landscape and, uh, and offering his, his perspectives after being in the industry for uh, so many years. He's uh, welcome you to ask questions during the presentation, please. And, um, and also the uh, slides will be available afterward, even if there's some adjustments for uh, any corrections done between the time we got them and, and now. Okay, so please, everyone, welcome Zev Shimko. Great. Well, thanks for the introduction, Dad. I don't know if I've said that before in a quasi-public setting. <laughs> and certainly a, a scary thought to hear myself on 5x speed. Usually 1x is plenty fast. Um, so really great to, great to meet everybody. I'm excited to share a bit about my background, my journey, which at a high level has gone from very traditional investment banking to fintech to less regulated cryptocurrency to blockchain technology to hyper-regulated digital assets and banking and, and a lot of things in between, which, which I'll go through. I do also want to provide some practical tips on even finding careers in the space, you know, what the opportunities are. Of course, everyone's first thought leaving a program like this is go work for a big bank, you know, go on a trading floor. But there are so many more opportunities that, quite frankly, I was not aware of when, when I got out of college myself, and I did not know anything about the startup and fintech world when I started at Morgan Stanley. So with that, I'm going to share a presentation to help guide the conversation. Uh, but as my father mentioned, please feel free to interrupt with any questions. Um, I know it's not a massive group, so I think just chiming in might, might be most efficient, but feel free to raise a hand as well, and we'll figure out what works best there. So I did want to give a brief background just on my personal journey. Um, I did go to Northeastern in Boston and studied finance, which I think is broadly considered to be just a, a general business degree, wasn't hyper quantitative, um, wasn't you know really focused on technology, and it was really more around just financial basics and, and insurance. Um, I, in my mind, I always wanted to go to a big bank. I always wanted to do one of those investment banking analyst programs. And I was lucky to land at Morgan Stanley, first in the debt capital markets division, working on some of these large investment bond grade offerings for uh, big institutions, right? So it's selling billions of dollars of bonds to ensure that the Pfizer's of the world have access to capital. Um, I thought that was really interesting. It was very market driven. Um, and at the end of the day, the deals ended up feeling very, very repetitive, right? If you raise a billion dollars for this company and then you do it for this company and you do it for another, I felt that those deals felt very similar time and time again. And so I spent my third year on the equity capital market side, where you have to know a lot more about the companies themselves, the products, how they differentiate from other companies in the space. And it's less about the market and relative bond prices and where the tenured treasury is, because that's really all you care about when you think about a large company being able to repay investment grade debt. Um, while I was at Morgan Stanley, I witnessed a lot of IPOs and equity offerings, and I saw these small tech companies after a period of five years go public, and quite honestly, I saw these founders make a ton of money, and I just did not have any exposure to this industry, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I can go start at one of these companies five years ago, right? If I can get to a small fintech company, if I can get to a startup, help grow that company and it go public. That was honestly my thought when I was at Morgan Stanley. Now, the difficulty for folks going from big bank world to startups 
is that there aren't many roles in companies that are a perfect match, right? Big companies have very different needs than small companies. And so it did take me a while to figure out where I could even apply to find a job. Um, that's what led me to FinTech. And we'll talk more about what FinTech means, but essentially it was one of the few areas of the startup world where you had the same role at a bank and at a startup, and that was capital markets for me. So that was ensuring that these fintechs had access to capital, right? I'm sure many of you have heard of companies like SoFi and Lending Club and Prosper and all of these companies where you can get loans for various types of purposes, but maybe you don't think about where that money comes from, right? At the end of the day, in most cases, it still just comes from the capital markets via securitizations and maybe from revolving lending facilities before that or institutional investors funding what's called home lo whole loans, which we'll get into a bit later. Um, I was then getting really into digital assets and cryptocurrency. I was living in San Francisco at the time, spending a lot of time with software engineers and more tech-minded individuals. And I found myself spending nights and weekends learning more about Bitcoin. What is blockchain? How does it work? Why are people using it? And made the decision that it needs to be in the industry full-time to really understand how this technology worked which led me to a company called Salt Lending, where I led capital markets and corporate development. Uh, this company was the first company in the US to lend US dollars against digital assets like Bitcoin. So if you had millions of dollars of Bitcoin, you couldn't go to a bank to get a loan. They wouldn't recognize that asset. They wouldn't lend against it, but Salt Lending would. And they would essentially be able to value the collateral in real time, but also have possession of it and have the ability to sell it right away if a borrower did not make repayments. And so having better technology really created a more efficient form of collateral. Um, and that's really what drew, drew me to, to salt lending. Uh, I then wanted to work with you know, founders that have just proven success. And one founder that I looked up to was uh, Mike Cagney, who was the founder and CEO of SoFi. And he was building a new company called Figure Technologies, which had its own internal proprietary blockchain for the issuance, trading, and securitizing of financial assets. So instead of using backend technologies and spreadsheets and oracles for maintaining things like individual loans, student loans, or HELOCs, they would essentially originate these assets on a shared blockchain ledger. Again, we can get into more details, but really created a more efficient marketplace for the buying and selling and trading of these assets and it was an incredibly successful and still is a very successful company. I uh, would have stayed there for probably quite a while if it wasn't for my now co-founder and CEO, Caitlin Long, who is a well-known advocate in the digital asset space, who reached out to me um, with plans to start a bank focused on digital assets. Um, she was looking for folks that had experience in banking, that had experience in capital markets and startups and that she can trust and new digital assets and the you know, Venn diagram where all those meet in the middle is not very large. So it was really <laughs> a lucky position for, for me to be in, um, right time, right place. And it really was an opportunity that, that I jumped at. For the last three years, we've been building a bank. So we are a regulated bank. We did receive our certificate of authority. We do now file call reports and we're geared towards the digital asset industry. So in some ways, we're a very normal state bank providing deposit and payment services to customers when we start to take our external customers. But we also have plans for regulated Bitcoin custody for institutions and other products that we're working on as well. Um, so I will talk a little bit about digital assets at the end of the presentation. Happy to take some questions on digital assets. But I did plan to spend most of the time on fintech as I thought that'd be most applicable to, to this group. Zan, can I ask a question? Elizabeth, can I ask a question, please? Don't mind Absolutely. Me. Regarding the prior position, um, not before your current job, did the blockchain also enable like a more deep dive underwriting or, um, you know, as far as the risk decision for making these loans, in addition to the technological benefits and efficiencies, does it also enable you to quarter like literally price the loans more efficiently and know which loans to make and sort of stuff like that? Uh, with block with the blockchain, um, you know, kind of platform. So the short answer is no. It was really more around source of truth and having valid and safe data. 
Right. So a blockchain is only as good as the data that it is fed. And, you know, we like to use the term garbage in, garbage out. If you have a unified shared ledger that is immutable and can't be changed and can't be altered with, well, if the data on that blockchain isn't good, that doesn't really help you. And so what a blockchain does is it can validate that all of your verifications, for example, have run successfully and it can save that in, a, in an immutable form with that loan asset. So when that ever gets traded in the future, now you don't need to hire an outside auditor to right. uh, perform an audit on that portfolio and pay them $50,000, $100,000. You know for a fact that that asset has not been tampered with. You know for a fact that their uh, credit criteria has been you know, verified, at least to the degree that the company has verified it. And you also know that you're not trusting somebody with their Excel spreadsheet um, because I've also been involved with loan sales and securitizations that have all been executed on Excel spreadsheets. And yes, you make errors once in a while, right? You might need to buy back loans that were sold in error. You know, you really cut down on the operational issues and the erroneous uh, transfers when using something like a blockchain. Like what if, you know, now, let's say that the, the interest payments came out on which day, for instance, right? You want to know that, for instance, have interest come in on the, on the due date each month going back, you know, however many years, right? You, like, you want to know that, right? I guess. Sure. And, and that can be fully automated. And for example, if, if you buy a loan right now in the secondary market, it might be very difficult to determine if that loan in the past, especially if it's a very long dated loan, like a 30 year mortgage, has it ever been modified? Like maybe somebody's trying to cover that up. And so you really get that source of truth and that history, the untampered history with the blockchain. And so it's better data, it's faster transactions, with, which both ultimately result in lower fees. And now lower fees can go both ways. Lower fees can sure. either mean more revenue for the issuer, or it could mean a lower APR for the borrower, right? So I, I think savings is fungible. It just depends on where you want to put it in the flow. I see. Thank you. Understood. Great. No, great question. Um, so I wanted to throw this image up on the screen. It comes from CB Insights. And every year, they develop a list of the top 250 fintechs. So the point here is not to be able to discern the individual logos, but the point here is that fintech is a really, really broad category of um, you know, say finance and banking, and you really have applications across asset management, capital markets, banking, insurance, et cetera. At a really high level, what fintech has evolved to is really any application of technology to make financial services better, whether financial services are payroll or insurance or capital markets or loans, it's basically banking services, financial services with a layer of technology. I did uh, use my old investment banking editing skills and put a little box around the area that I want to talk about in more detail in this conversation, which, which is really the, the lending and the capital market side, because I do think there is a lot of similarity between what you do at a fintech lender and what you would do at a bank running similar processes. And in many examples, in many cases, banks and fintechs will need to work together in a marketplace lending or capital markets flow. So staying high level for another few minutes, um, you'll see three images on your screen. Uh, these are three apps that are very widely used uh, by consumers in the US. Um, you know, usually I ask people to call it out, but I'll spare spare the trouble here. The left is Cash App, the middle is Venmo, and the right is uh, Apple Pay or Apple Cash. And to many people, these feel like banks. These are banking products, right? This is where you can hold cash. This is how you can pay your friends. This is how you can apply for a loan. But in fact, these are actually fintech companies. And so I wanted to make a distinction between fintech companies and banks, because the line is very blurred today. And with some companies, it's very hard to discern whether or not they're a fintech or a bank. So how can you tell if you know the company you're holding money with is a technology company that may not have the regulatory oversight of the bank, or whether or not they're a bank that comes with a lot of regulatory oversight and perhaps more comfort for, for the end user. Um, very importantly, but fintechs do not get access to what's called the Federal Reserve payment system. They do not get a master account at the Fed. They do not get to borrow at the discount window, right? They really are just technology companies. So when you talk about that need to access capital or bank services or deposit accounts 
there is always a bank partner behind them, which is not clear to the, the average consumer. And so at a high level, right, if you think about a FinTech versus a bank, FinTechs are tech forward. They have efficient front ends, which is really the nice user experience or UI that you see when you go to a FinTech website. And importantly, they're capital light. So they can grow very quickly. They tend to have high multiples for valuations as opposed to banks that are in many cases, and, and we're trying to change this, of course, but not as tech forward, right? And they have increased compliance and regulatory oversight. But one of the big benefits of being a bank is you get that direct Fed access. You get a lower cost of capital. And that's why banks do issue lots and lots of things like mortgages, but they don't have the efficient front ends or the marketing capabilities to reach the average consumer for all of the fintech products that you're used to seeing in the market. And so the fintech really brings an efficient front end, a flashy front end for consumers, but also the marketing and user acquisition. Right, they're using the bank in the background to facilitate the services, to get capital, right? But they're the ones that are bringing the consumers to this product and that is why they're compensated. And that is why maybe with the exception of the last year or two, they've done really, really well, right? I mean, FinTech market caps have grown enormously. We have had a bit of a tech and FinTech correction in the market. Granted, there's just been a general market correction, but there have been some massive FinTechs that have entered the public space over the last couple of years. Um, Upstart, for example, which I'll talk about, IPO'd a couple of years ago and hit a $30 billion market cap. A firm, which was a lending company, FinTech, not a bank, hit about a $40, $50 billion market cap. These are massive, massive companies that are running a capital light model. So on the point that banks need to work with FinTechs, just wanted to throw up a couple examples to show that Many of the names that you're familiar with, because they're not banks, they need to work with banks, right? So again, whether it's for capital, whether it's for banking services, there usually is, in the large majority of cases, a bank working behind the scenes with a fintech. So marketplace lending. I want to focus a little bit on the specific fintech vertical of online lending my experience revolves more around consumer loans. So Is those are companies, yep. I wanna ask a question about the last slide if you don't mind. Could you talk about the different strategies of the, of the banks involved and what their, what their motives are in, in um, you know, supporting, uh, supporting the industry in this way? If they differ? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a high level answer and I do think this is starting to change, but over the last, let's say five or 10 years, really the primary motive for banks to work with fintechs and, and really to work with any partner and customer is just aggregating more deposits, right? The average typical bank is in the business of making loans, is in the business of making a spread. So they're happy to work with fintechs from a payment provider perspective, from a capital providing perspective, but their main focus is really just aggregating deposits so that they can increase the size of their balance sheet increase the amount of loans they're making. Now, I think as the, the line between fintechs and banks is starting to blur a bit, meaning that banks are actually getting better with technology and understanding that these fintech fee-based models, as opposed to a bank spread-based models, also have merit, you're seeing banks starting to charge things like SaaS fees, so software as a service. So if a bank is giving a fintech access to a bank account and payments, Right, they might be charging them five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month in order to get that access via API so that they can execute programmatic payments. A lot of these fintechs, of course, are executing thousands of payments a month, a month, whether they're for loan repayments, right, from companies like SoFi or Lending Club or Prosper, or maybe they're credit card payments. And so you can't do that via an online banking portal. You can't have that FinTech need to log in and manually execute that payment. And so in the past, you've, have, you've had things like SFTP file transfers, but really the bigger banks, the more tech forward banks are all developing their own APIs and developer portals. Or even if you Google you know, Wells Fargo APIs, you'll see that they have a fully robust developer portal to be able to support their FinTech partnerships. Um, but I would say still nine out of 10 times the answer is deposits and really just growing their deposit base. Thank you. 
Of course. So I wanted to, again, deep dive on marketplace lending, you know, from what I've heard um, with regards to the program and what even the students would be interested in from a career perspective, I do actually think there are a lot of opportunities in this specific vertical of FinTech. And I wanted to explain really the flow of capital in a marketplace lending model, right? What a consumer normally sees and knows is that they can go to SoFi and they can apply for a loan. But how does that work? Where is that capital coming from? Who are the other players involved? I tried to find a purpose purposely complex image, which isn't that complex to really just reiterate that there is a lot behind the scenes of a marketplace lender. And so there is a common misnomer today. Um, this industry started really back in 2008 with Lending Club and Prosper. Those were the two first consumer focused marketplace lenders that would offer you know, online access and online applications for consumer loans. And back then, the industry was actually called peer-to-peer -peer lending or P2P lending, which you still hear from time to time, but not as much as you've heard in the past. The reason why it was called peer-to-peer -peer lending is because the funding for these loans, right? So if you were going to get a $5,000 Prosper loan, the funding would actually come from individuals. So you'd have accredited investors come to the platform. They would invest one, five, ten, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000, and that capital will be used to fund the borrower loans. And every month when the borrower made repayments, the platform would get their cut, they would get a servicing fee. Again, they are a technology platform for the facilitation of these loans. And once that servicing fee is paid, the remainder would go back to that accredited investor. Now that worked at a small scale, but if you think about a P2P lender doing a hundred million dollars of loans a year, a billion dollars of loans a year, if your average accredited investor is going to give you five thousand dollars to invest, you need to find a lot, a lot of investors. Yeah. And so, what happened was, you know, maybe five years after Lending Club and Prosper initially came out, you start to have these institutional investors that would commit a hundred, five hundred million, a billion dollars of institutional capital to fund these loans. So, would you rather try to go after? 10,000 accredited investors from a marketing perspective and user acquisition perspective, which is very expensive, or do you want to partner with a well-known middle market capital provider, or as you scale, the well-known investment banks? Obviously, the answer being the latter. And so today, there really aren't even many platforms at all that even offer the ability for individual funding, and you really don't hear Peter Peer anymore because it's all institutional funding. On the institutional funding side, you do have some investors that will buy what's considered whole loans. And so they might say, you know, here's $100,000 of capital to invest in these loans. And I want to own 10 $10,000 loans for that capital. And they have no interest in leveraging that up. They have no interest in selling that again in the secondary market. They're very happy with an unlevered 5, 6, 7% return for just holding those assets. Now, of course, um, as you grow volumes from a marketplace lending perspective, you need bigger sources of capital. And so the warehouse facility market is really where that starts from a bank perspective. And these are all the big banks that you know, right? These are, this is Morgan Stanley, Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, all the big names have what's called warehouse departments. They provide lines of credit to these lenders where the collateral for those lines are the loans themselves. And so you will have a bank that will provide a $250 million warehouse facility to an online lender. That online lender would then originate $250 million of loans using the warehouse line. Once that warehouse line is used, meaning that you have $250 million of originated loans, the next step is securization. Right, because what the platform wants to do from a fintech perspective, their main motivation is volume. Right, they're getting origination fees, they're getting servicing fees, and again, going back to one of the prior slides, they want to be capital light. They don't want to be constrained by balance sheet. They want to use other people's balance sheets and pump through volume of these loans. And so, the fintechs or the marketplace lenders, and I use those terms interchangeably. interchangeably would securitize those assets that are in these warehouse facilities 
sell them in the public markets to public investors where you typically have a lower cost, right? It's really what the expected or what the need is from the investor from a net return perspective and free up the capacity in those warehouse facilities. And so you basically take that back down to zero and the fintech starts over. And so if you look up fintech securitizations, you'll see that these platforms are securitizing $250, $500 million of loans every quarter. And as long as those loans are performing, meaning the public investors are getting paid, they can continue to do that in the public market. Now, that performing piece is really important, of course. If a fintech originates a bunch of loans and those loans default and investors lose a lot of money, that fintech is going to go out of business, right? And so this is really where the application of quantitative finance and machine learning, and in some cases, AI, really comes into play with these marketplace lenders. Um, and I did want to drill down a bit on a company called Upstart. Um, I joined Upstart when they were less than 100 people back in 2016. They're now a fairly large company with a lot more people. I'm actually not sure how many. Um, and have originated roughly $20 billion in unsecured consumer loans. Now, there is certainly a spectrum of how technology forward certain companies are. As you all know, you can have some lenders that primarily rely on your FICO score, right? Literally, there are some lenders out there that will only look at FICO in determining what your rate would be for a loan. Now, of course, if you're a technology company and you hear that, you say, well, I could probably use more data or I can use better data or I can use different data. And you're competing against every other fintech out there, right? From a consumer perspective, a consumer has hundreds of fintechs to go to for a loan, but they're really going to go to the fintech that gives them the best rate. The reason they're going to get the best rate is because that fintech believes that they are pricing that borrower appropriately, that they do not believe that borrower is going to default. And so they, they can give them the most competitive APR possible. It obviously also is impacted by the fintech's cost of capital. All else equal, if that warehouse line costs them 5%, you know, maybe the loan APR will be 10%. But if that warehouse line goes up to 6%, well, if the fintech lender still needs a 5% return, obviously the borrower APR is going to go up as well. So when this industry started back in 2008, really the primary factor for determining credit, and it's still a large factor today, surprisingly, and I do hope this, change, just this changes with better technology, is FICO, right? And FICO is not perfect, but it still is a very, very good predictor for default probability. And so the less tech forward fintechs will use FICO as a model, will have, you know, the typical, you know, chart of FICO versus um, rate uh, or versus loan grade, um, and we'll come out with a borrow APR based off primarily FICO. Now, obviously, technology companies um, have realized that it's probably not the best way to underwrite a borrower. We have a lot more access to information. We have a lot more advanced techniques for underwriting than we had 10 or 20 years ago. And so you see companies like Upstart come onto the scene. Upstart was unique in the sense that not only did they use machine learning and AI techniques in their underwriting and hire real data scientists, they also used alternative data in making those decisions. So again, different data and better underwriting should ultimately result in lower defaults if you have better predictability for borrower repayments. And so where most lenders relied on credit criteria and anything they can find on the credit report, again, FICO at the top, and then you had number of delinquencies or number of 90-day past due loans, or you know, did this customer ever go into bankruptcy? Um, they used other data, including education and occupational data. So a borrower based off their credit might have a 10% APR, but what if they have a college degree and they worked at Google? What does that do to their um, probability of default? Well, it turns out it decreases the probability of default, right? What if they live in certain areas? And obviously you need to be mindful of what you can and what you can't underwrite on. There are restrictions, right? Like age and race and other factors, but they use different data and additional data and a lot more data when, when making these decisions. There was one interesting conversation that I remember from years ago where all else equal, if you're looking at FICO, you would generally assume that somebody with a perfect FICO, right? 800 
or 850. Now, now I don't remember the perfect FICO score, but you would think that somebody with a perfect FICO score would have a very low probability default and would be the safest borrower that you can lend to. Um, what was interesting to find out after applying, you know, machine learning techniques and looking at a lot of data was that, you know, there's usually a reason why somebody with a perfect FICO needs a loan, and it's not typically for a good reason. And so actually, borrowers that had really good FICOs, but not perfect FICOs, actually had a lower probability of default when looking at the data, right? And so when you have a very simplistic model based primarily on credit, you're looking at a linear curve, right? Higher FICO, higher rates. When you use machine learning and you use better data and more data, you know, it's a continuous curve and it might not be up, you know, throughout throughout the graph, right? You can have blips depending on certain, you know, borrowers, certain criteria, right? And certain attributes that the model is picking up. And so more and more lenders, especially in the fintech world, are moving to models like Upstart, where they're using more than just credit, right? To get a better picture of whether or not the borrower is going to repay uh, the loan. And that really is the single most important factor in this industry. Because when you can have better predictability of defaults, you can better price your loans, you can guarantee more safely, I don't want to use the word guarantee, but more likely guarantee a return for your investors and ensure that you're going, you're going to continue to attain funding and actually be able to originate these loans and earn your revenue. And so this okay. picture, go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to make a comment about this. Actually, very interesting. I want to point out that you know I used to work in securitized products, and you know we had a lot of these new asset classes come to the scene as raw material for securitization. And one reason was, of course, because traditional the benchmark categories, ABS were trading fairly expensively, even down to the you know down the stack. So imagine, let's say, one of the big issues became, well, if you're securitizing a new collection of assets, for instance wireless handset loans given out by the carriers or marketplace lending originations, right? The question emerged both from rating agencies and the investors. Well, we don't know how these loan borrowers are gonna perform in alternative economic environments because they originated when rates were very low, you know, and performance was generally positive, right? So this, this is similar to the question about when 15 years ago they introduced mortgages where you could allow the mortgage to negatively amortize, that will repay less than your credit interest. So the question came up, well, how will these borrowers prepay? Like, what will their response be to seeing interest rate variability, right? And if you can't deliver that information, it makes it harder to sell the classes you're trying to, you're going to originate securitization because people are going to want to interrogate the performance of the of the asset ABS as you're, you've originated in various environments. So this is a big issue um, four, five, six, seven years ago because we had not been through bad economic times. Like let's say you're a, you know, you're a, you're a pool of uh, boat loans or, fra or um, franchise loans, or let's say, um, um, I can't think right now, um, um, uh, vacation homes, uh, timeshare, ho timeshare loans, right? How are those? So there are there are yacht loans. There are other loans exactly. Yeah. Loans. How will uh, the borrowers not just basically prepay or credit? What about prepayment performance? We don't have the data because the loans have not been tracked because they've not. So been, it's a uh, it's a yeah. great question and and it really is great because I feel like I'm back at Upstart having a conversation with one of the investors and walking them through this. Um, a couple ways to answer that question. You're right. What with most of these lenders starting after the 08, 09 recession, they haven't been through really turbulent market conditions and you haven't evaluated the performance of that type of asset. And so in the early days, especially of a new lender, it is more difficult to get funding and it's going to cost you more. And when you do your first securization, it's likely going to be unrated. But after you have right. performance for a couple of years, it will get rated and then you get a get and again you get access to lower cost capital because there are many public investors that can only buy rated securitizations, not unrated securitizations. On the recession point, what was really important and what Upstart did is you can do regression testing and back testing on our model. So there's always some bias in that because you know what outcome you're trying to achieve, of course, but you can get decades of data from the credit bureaus and other sources where you can vigorously back test your model to see how it would have performed during periods of market stress. 
Now, it's obviously not a perfect answer, but it's better than not having done that. Um, additionally, uh, most lenders don't want to finance assets that haven't seen a full life cycle of the term. For example, if it's a marketplace lender that has been in business for two years, but they want to now originate five-year loans, right? they're not comfortable originating that asset because they'd rather see five years of history before they start right. to originate a five-year loan for obvious reasons. And so it is tough for new fintechs to establish that trust in the market, but it's no question that the initial funding that these fintechs get is really expensive for primarily that reason, right? And so I remember your first facility, uh, you know, for a marketplace lender, if you just launch, would be in the ballpark of 12 or 14 percent. Wow. Where the big amazing. guys would be probably in the three or four percent range. It is a massive, massive spread. Now, you know, the fintechs can manage that because they raise a lot of venture capital and, and private equity, and they don't necessarily need to make money on the first few deals that they do. Um, but it is tough to get access to that capital for all, all the reasons you mentioned, right? And so really being able to prove or demonstrate to investors that you have, whether again, better data, alternative data, more data, and that early signs are showing su success is really important. But it might, it, it does take the big guys a while to get on board with that. Your first warehouse facility is not going to be from a big bank. It's going to be from a sharky middle market provider, right? So um, I guess my short answer is I agree with every, everything you said. I directly experienced that and have been on the other side of that conversation. But over time, it got easier for Upstart because they continued to show improvement for those loans, right? That's why their securizations became rated. That's why their investors continue to put more capital. That's why they got warehouse facilities from these big banks. But that is probably the most difficult aspect of starting a marketplace lender or a fintech lender is getting access to low cost capital. And so a practical strategy there is try to get one of these banks on your cap table. They might be more incentivized to give you low cost funding, right? So I think there are some practical solutions that fintechs try to put in place, but it is certainly tough to, to manage. Thank you. From uh, so looking at this visual here for for Upstart, really what this shows, and it is self evident, but I'll I'll repeat it because I think it's important that Upstart was able to approve many more borrowers and originate much more loans with fewer defaults, right? And they were able to have that high approval rate or a higher approval rate than banks and other lenders with the same default rate. Right, so really what that shows in two different ways is that, again, either they have better data or they have more data, more applicable data, or they have better underwriting techniques. And it just goes back to you know, machine learning and AI and really understanding what these borrowers' propensity to repay is. Um, one more point in response, Leon, to your comments, you know, when there is a recession, when it gets really tough, especially when you think about unsecured consumer loans, which is the majority of marketplace lending, you would think a borrower might be more inclined to pay their car loan over an right. unsecured loan, right? Because they need that to drive to work, right? Sure. And so consumer loans really get hit pretty hard in periods of market stress, especially on the subprime credit spectrum, right? So all those sequel and at a high level, if you take averages, if you look at a regression, yes, higher FICO, lower default rate, lower FICO, higher default rate, but really what companies like Upstart have learned that it's not a straight line and it's not linear, right? It really is a continuous line that really goes up and down depending on specific borrower attributes. And so you really start to see, uh, and even five, 10 years ago, you didn't have this, but now if you, if you go to LinkedIn and you look at jobs and you know, I didn't want to talk about even some practical ways to, to find some of these opportunities, you'll see postings for data scientists, you know, machine learning engineers, right? Big data, quantitative analysts, like those rules didn't exist in, you know, those types of companies in the past, right? Or at least in this capacity, obviously they existed, you know, more in trading and big bang floors, et cetera. But data science in particular is becoming much more prevalent in these types of companies and not all lenders have them, right? Again, the ones with basic models that just have your typical, you know, financial analysts or risk analysts um, make do without data scientists and machine learning, it really depends on what the strategy is for, for the business. I did want to briefly talk about digital assets and fintechs. And you know, what I what I hope to see over the years is more convergence between the two. 
um, because it is new technology entering the space. It's affecting banks, it's affecting fintechs, it's affecting, it's affecting payments. Um, and there's a lot right now that's happening in the US, in the regulatory space. And there really is a bit of a TBD in terms of how it's all going to play out. So I know that it's going to look different, but I can't tell you exactly how, which is concerning in some ways, but also very exciting. I did want to mention just the concept of stable coins, which is the issuance of or tokenization of dollars, right? Actual dollars, not crypto, but dollars on a blockchain. And so you're taking the stability of a US dollar and, and hopefully it remains stable um, with the technical benefits of a digital asset or a cryptographic asset. Um, when you think about sending payments, if you've heard of wire transactions or ACH transactions, these aren't instant payments. They can take a day, they can take three days, they can cost a lot of fees, they can be reversed, they can be canceled, they might have limits. Like there are you know, setbacks and drawbacks with the traditional forms of payments. Stable coins on the other hand can be sent from one compatible wallet to any other compatible wallet anywhere in the world, right? In a matter of minutes, there's full auditability. Anybody in the world can see that transaction if they had the transaction ID or what's called the hash. And I think it's really going to improve the payment infrastructure, not just in the US, but, but around the world. Never before have we had a currency that truly is borderless or um, that can be sent within, again, minutes with full auditability, again, with that single source of truth being a blockchain. And if it's a public blockchain, is actually auditable by anybody with, with the information. So I didn't want to dive into stable coins and, and payments in this presentation, but didn't want to mention it because I find it personally interesting and it may be something that folks want to look into. Um, talked a little bit about cryptocurrency collateral for loans, right? We just talked a lot about unsecured consumer loans. And obviously when something is unsecured and a borrower defaults, there's no recourse for the lender. And so there are a lot of these fintechs trying to come up with new products or adding asset-backed products, whether it's a HELOC or home equity line of credit or a mortgage or um, other liens on hard assets, right? They want something to be able to go after if a borrower defaults, which also helps with the issue that Leon brought up, right? Where, you know, at least you have some residual value, right? If a borrower owes you 50,000 in defaults, but they have a $40,000 car behind there, at least the lender can get a portion of that money back. The really interesting component of digital asset collateral, whether it's cryptocurrency, whether it's tokenized securities, whether it's tokenized real estate, whatever it may be, is that the lender can actually have possession of that collateral and can almost instantly liquidate that collateral if they need to. So gone are the days are finding repo man and going to get a car <laughs> that may or may not be in a parking lot. They then need to sell at a huge discount. You actually can have, especially if it's digitally native, like cryptocurrencies, like NFTs, right? There are lots of examples. You do have the ability to almost instantly sell that if the market drops below a certain degree for a margin call or if the borrower defaults on the loan. So I think of digital assets providing just more efficient forms of collateral, which ultimately ends up protecting the lender if done properly. There are lots of other areas of digital assets that I think would be very interesting to this group. Obviously, just like there are exchanges for equities, there are exchanges for digital assets, there are prime brokers. The derivatives market is continuing to get deeper and deeper and more active. Um, and so I would just encourage, I think it is really a new era of finance within digital assets. I think, again, it's going to converge more with the traditional banking and fintech world. Um, and there are lots and lots of fintechs and startups and non-bank companies that are hiring for these roles. Um, so I just wanted to throw a few ideas out there. I know a lot of folks in this presentation are looking for uh, a job after they graduate or trying to figure out where they want to go. Uh, my point being that there is a lot of opportunity. I did not know about I did not know about a lot of this, you know, when I started in this industry, when I was at Morgan Stanley, I thought that was the end all be all. Don't get me wrong. It was great. I would do it again in a heartbeat. Right. But I really um, learned a lot about fintech and startups and understood how big this industry really is. And if you have a machine learning or a quant background, it doesn't just mean you need to go to a big bank or on a trading floor. There are lots and lots of opportunities out there. So hopefully that was okay on time. Um, I would love to, to field you know, any questions, whether it's about the presentation, myself or, or any other topic. Hopefully that was either 
insightful or helpful, um, at the very least interesting, but really was a pleasure getting to speak to the group. Um, I do think that, again, FinTech is here to stay. Technology keeps making things better, faster, cheaper, right? That's also the promise of blockchain. And so just really getting into the tech side of finance, I think is going to be a big opportunity. Fantastic, thank you very much, Seth. Uh, any questions from the floor? I just raised my hand. This is Rick. Hi, Rich. Uh, Rick, um, yeah, so what can you say about what's going on with Custodia and banks and crypto in light of all the changes that have happened since um, we recently used FTX and, uh, and other banks? I mean, banks that have nothing to do with crypto um, seem to have been in trouble. Um, so what can you say? Yeah, I, I can say a lot. Uh, so let's see what would be most interesting. Um, as everyone knows, there have been several bank failures over the last few months. You know, let, let me start with FTX because that really happened first, right? FTX was seemingly a great company. They had great technology. They were growing very quickly. They had some of the best investors supporting them. They raised a ton of capital. Unfortunately, uh, there was fraud, right? And there were fraudsters there. Um, and that really, really, really hurts the digital asset industry. Uh, FTX was able to get in very close with regulators. They were able to um, you know, be in congressional hearings. They got very close with very important people helping to shape what you know, future policy for digital assets could look like uh, and really blew it up to, to be honest. And so I think it was really a terrible, um, uh, really just a terrible situation for the digital asset industry because I think this industry lost a lot of trust with what happened with FTX specifically. Obviously with every industry, there are bad players, but this was just such a large player, such an important player, such you know a close player to our, our regulators in this country. Now, there certainly feels like there's been this anti-crypto regulatory environment in, in the US. And in, in some ways I'd say that that feels true. In other ways, it's, it's unclear. Um, when you look at the bank failures, uh, let's take Silicon Valley Bank and Silvergate, you know, those really were more traditional bank runs, right? They had um, really long dated portfolios of assets, of mortgages, of corporate bonds. And when rates went up, they basically had this really large unrealized loss that isn't necessarily a problem if you hold it to term, but if you need to sell it to meet your obligations, you're taking a big loss. And what happened was the combination of increased withdrawals by customers, right? And because also a lot of their customers were driven by technology partnerships, this happened very, very quickly. There was also some, I would say, encouragement by the VC community to withdraw out of these specific institutions in order to meet withdrawals because banks only hold 8% of assets, right? On their balance sheet, they needed to start selling these fixed income portfolios they had at large losses. And then that really was a vicious cycle, right? So you you sell assets, you take a loss to meet your borrower withdrawal requests, right? Borrowers, or sorry, depositors are concerned that you're taking this loss and there are more depositors are asking for withdrawals. And you basically have a traditional bank run, but all in an online fashion, right? And so there are some staggering numbers where billions of dollars were withdrawn in a matter of minutes or hours. Um, back in the day when you had a bank run, you had to wait, wait in line, right? One by one, go through the mm -hmm. bank and you actually had more time to try to meet those withdrawal requests. And so I would say that those banks, you know, from my perspective, looked more like traditional bank runs and poor risk management. Obviously, it's much easier to say in hindsight. Uh, there was a bank in New York called Signature Bank um, that did some activity with the digital asset industry. They were very heavy in, in real estate. Uh, and it's unclear to me, quite frankly, if they had a full bank run. There were elevated deposits, but that bank did not fail in the same way that Silvergate and Signature did. Right. And so I think there were some questions as to, you know, how did their crypto activity influence what happened with that bank? Um, and I would say that from my experience, it is difficult right now for any company in the digital asset industry to obtain a reliable bank partner. Um, this has happened in the past with other industries. Uh, you know, there's a term called operation choke point, which you can look into, but it does feel like we are overreacting as a country or perhaps as a regulatory body to companies like FTX and really making it difficult right now for digital assets. That being said, uh, at Custodia, I mean, we are taking 
a very difficult path for a very important reason. We became a bank. We're signing ourselves up for a very heightened level of compliance and regulatory requirements. And so we do think that that landscape is going to change. Um, but admittedly, it's been it's been tough, I believe, for the digital asset industry, um, more so since the FTX collapse, because that did really, really kill a lot of trust that this industry had with regulators in Washington. Great. Uh, thank you. Other questions from the floor? Leon, are you, are you clocking in or are you just uh, clicking over there? Oh, that, that wasn't me, no. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. No I, problem. <laughs> I, have, I have a question. So um, taking, uh, taking aside, I recognize you can't speak for Custodia. What is your, your personal view on, on holding Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies as investment assets uh, in the next year? Also a good question. Um, I would say that I, I don't view myself as a good trader, um, but I do like the statement that um, Chamath Palihapitiya made about Bitcoin. And he called it many years ago, schmuck insurance. You know, what if this is, you know, the next big thing? What if a global currency is really what, um, not this industry, but this country or, or the world really needs for um, better access to capital, more fair access, right? And not having the red tape of the banking infrastructure. Um, the technology itself is is really, really good technology. And, you know, you hear people sometimes make the distinction between Bitcoin and blockchain. But when Bitcoin first came out in 2008, end of 2008, they were the same thing, right? Bitcoin is really just the currency application of blockchain, right? And so it's really hard to say. And when I hear, oh, blockchain is great, it's going to transform financial services. But no, Bitcoin doesn't work at all. That doesn't make any sense. Like those two statements don't reconcile for me. Um, and so I think that the, you know, yes, it's a, a large market cap today, but if Bitcoin continues to get adopted in increasing fashion, right, you know, it's supply and demand. You can't print more Bitcoin, right? You can print, and we do print a lot more dollars. There are only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin in circulation. And so that's why you can have fractional Bitcoin up to the one 100 millionth, which is called a Satoshi, but you can't print more. And so simple supply and demand says that if it's going to stay around, if there's going to continue to be increased interest, the price should go up. And so my very general non-committal answer is I think it's going to go up at some point in the future. I don't know how high and I don't know how long that's going to take. Um, but personally, I am bullish on Bitcoin. Uh, and I also would make the distinction that not all cryptocurrencies are created equal. Bitcoin is truly decentralized. There is no central authority sitting at the top. There is no private company making money. There's no single individual being able to make a decision to influence the network. Now, for a lot of other tokens, that's not the case. There is a lot of fraud in the space. There has been a lot of fraud in the space. Anybody with technical chops can create their own token and sell it, right? You can have a Leon coin and sell it to the market for whatever someone's willing to pay. So Bitcoin, in my mind, is really in a class of its own, and it is viewed by institutional investors as a digital currency or digital commodity, commodity and sometimes you hear digital gold. You then hear a lot about Ethereum, which is the second largest market cap token, and that's more about programmatic payments and smart contracts. And so that's really helpful when it comes to things like, you know, financial assets and loans and contracts that need to be recorded on a blockchain. Bitcoin is purposely narrow in its capabilities so that it has more security. Ethereum is more robust in its capabilities, which does all those equal reduce the, the security. So again, my answer without it being financial tax or legal advice is that I'm personally bullish on Bitcoin. I just don't know how long it's going to take to adopt. And, you know, that said, um, it is possible for somebody to create a better Bitcoin, but I don't think that would even happen in a moment, right? Like you won't see a trillion dollar token go away one day and be created the next. I think we would see a flow from Bitcoin to this other token if it were created. Um, but it would be very difficult, I think, to replace Bitcoin given the number of what's called miners in the industry, the amount of infrastructure behind Bitcoin the amount of energy going to produce Bitcoin. There, there's really, a, it's not just, you know, a digital token that you can create out of thin air. It's a lot of energy and resources going into it. So it's going to be very hard to displace in my mind. So I have a question. There was a, you mentioned FTX. There was, a, there was an op-ed in the journal 
weeks after the debacle, somebody writing, I want to get your thoughts on this, that, well, if we really had had, at least if the, if the digital industry had been truly decentralized finance, you wouldn't have had this central place where a guy who wants to trade, you know, Bitcoin on, an, on the FTX exchange had to keep his or her money there. So we're sort of saying that, in fact, what happened with FTX argues in favor of true decentralization of finance, at least in terms of like, you know, where who, who holds money, I guess, right? Do you agree with that kind of observation in a general sense? So in part, there is a saying in the industry that goes, not your keys, not your coins. Meaning if you do not have control over the private keys containing the Bitcoin, you do not have possession of that Bitcoin. And I think that works for very tech-minded individuals, right? It's not, even today I'd admit, it's not the easiest process in the world to go buy what's called a hardware wallet to generate a cryptographic key and to hold Bitcoin on that yourself. There are also real security risks. There are real safety risks. I mean, if you have $500 million of Bitcoin on a hard drive, well, I'd be worried that you might get kidnapped. And that has happened, right? right? Uh, and so, yes, the I would say the, the true hardcore Bitcoiners or the really tech savvy folks, right? And, and obviously, including some average consumers will decide to hold Bitcoin directly on a hardware device that they control, right? Which is really the closest thing to true decentralization. Now, that being said, that doesn't work for everybody. That doesn't work in the normal security space. Like you have custodians and protections for a reason. And so I think it's more than okay and appropriate to hold a certain amount, right, where you control the private key. But I've quite frankly had Bitcoin where I've forgotten my password because I haven't put it in in six months. And my, my hardware wallet would have erased if I got 10 attempts incorrect, right? And so there are real reasons to have a custodian. But when you have a custodian, especially when they're not regulated, they're based offshore, yes, I'm talking about FTX, right? <laughs> they're not doing what they're saying they're doing. Right. And so that right. is part of the strategy for custodia where we are a regulated bank, right? We have legal requirements, regulatory requirements, capital requirements, right? To hold digital assets on behalf of customers and there are other things you can do to actually prove that. You can't do proof of reserves. You can cryptographically prove that you own all the digital assets you say you own. Of course, FTX did not do that, right? And they had good reason to not do that. It probably wouldn't have resulted in, in a great outcome for them. And so, yeah, I think it's really any new industry that just needs to mature, right? You know, you need the bad players to blow up, make mistakes, go away, get shut down. Wow. And, and that's really why a lot of this industry has been fighting for regulation, not against. Um, you probably heard the hearing um, with Gary Gensler the other week where he was asked whether or not Ethereum was a security and wouldn't give a yes or no answer. It's that <laughs> type of you know regula regulatory clarity that's needed because if you don't know whether or not something is a security, well, are you supposed to file with the SEC or not, right? I mean, there, there are real world implications to that uncertainty. Um, and so again, I think in the FTX case, unfortunately, there was just a lot of fraud um, with the good companies, with the regulated companies. It shouldn't at the end of the day be that different to trusting a large State Street or Bank of New York Mellon with your stock certificates. See, thank you. All right, well, thanks very much to everyone. And especially for that great idea of having the Leon token. Um, I'm going to go to the dean maybe next week and see if we can use that as a way to to fund a department. I, I can't year. guarantee a high market cap though, but uh, maybe I'll throw <laughs> yeah, a few I'll, bucks. I'll be selling it next week in the lobby of ten uh, one one uh, Metro Tech. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, we'll get that set up. So uh, okay, thank so, you. <laughs> on behalf of everyone here and those who will see the recording later on, um, thank you very much for presenting to us. Uh, I think there was a very informative and wide-reaching uh, presentation, and uh, and uh, I hope we can all. Uh, Show our thanks, a round of virtual applause, and, uh, and send Zev on his way. Thank you very much. Wonderful talk, Zev. Beautiful. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, everyone. You know, if you find me on LinkedIn, feel free to reach out, ask a question. I try to be as reachable as possible, but really enjoyed the discussion, and, and thank you for all the questions. Thank you, Zev. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good evening, everybody. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Bye-bye.